Welcome students to my latest installment of our special topics lecture videos. Lectures designed to help organic chemistry students prepare better for standardized exams. I'm Dr. Mike Christiansen from Utah State University and I am a Gemini. After today's lecture you should know the reagents and be able to predict the products of the following reactions. Hydrogenations of alkenes and alkynes, reductive emanation, Clements and Wolf Kishner reductions, Grignard reactions, hydride reductions of carbonyl compounds, using ketals or acetals as protecting groups in synthesis, cuprate coupling, Suzuki coupling, olefin metathesis, and Wittig reactions. To remind you of something we covered in our last presentation, you should recall that reductions are reactions in which something gains electrons and oxidations are reactions in which something loses electrons. Reductions and oxidations are always partnered together. That is, whenever something gets reduced, something else has to be oxidized in concert, and vice versa. And once again, we have our two mnemon mnemonics for remembering this. Leo the lion says "gur" and oil rig. A quick way to spot oxidate. Uh, <coughs> A quick way to spot reductions and oxidations is by remembering that gaining bonds to hydrogen or losing bonds to oxygen or losing carbon-carbon double or triple bonds is generally a reduction process. Gaining bonds to oxygen, losing bonds to hydrogen, and gaining double or triple bonds is generally an oxidation process. Now here's a reaction that you've seen about a million times which I found is the precise number of times a typical organic chemistry student has to see a reaction before he or she will actually remember it. <laughs> uh, that was a joke. Okay, so if we take an alkene and we treat it with hydrogen gas and a palladium or a platinum catalyst, it will hydrogenate it, reducing it all the way to an alkane. Now we should always remember, of course, that the hydrogens end up on the same side, which is to say they are cis or sin to each other. Now one more detail I have to include is the fact that these reactions can also be done with rhodium catalysts. A special catalyst of th that type is called Wilkinson's catalyst. I mention this not because I really give a rat's behind about it, but because many standardized exam writers do. Now, this is clearly illustrated by the following example, in which we have a cyclohexene that's been treated with hydrogen gas and palladium or platinum catalyst, and you'll notice that both hydrogens get added to the same side, so we end up with a cis compound. And the reason for this is, of course, because of the mechanism. We can see that the uh, alkene substrate nestles down onto the surface of the palladium or platinum catalyst, and the hydrogens are transferred from that catalyst onto the same face of the alkene. Thus, they always end up being added to the same side, giving syn addition and for the case of cyclohexenes, cis products. Now, Just so you know, you can also hydrogenate benzene, reducing it to cyclohexane, but it's really hard. Because of benzene stabilizing aromaticity, this reaction has to be done at 250 degrees Celsius under 25 atmospheres of pressure, which is virtually the temperature and pressure of hell and damnation themselves. You can also add hydrogens across a triple bond in an alkyne. However, with standard palladium and platinum catalysts, the alkyne gets fully reduced or hydrogenated to an alkane, as we see here. In other words, under these conditions, you can't take an alkyne and reduce it just to an alkene. So what if I want to reduce my alkyne to an alkene? What can I do? Well, I can react the alkyne with hydrogen gas and Lindler catalyst, which is really just palladium that's been poisoned with lead. Because of that poisoning, Lindler's catalyst is less reactive than typical palladium. Thus, it can add two hydrogens to my, my alkyne, converting it to an alkene, and then stop. As with the aforementioned catalytic hydrogenations, Lindler catalyst also adds the hydrogens to the same side, so I get a Z alkene. So what if I don't want the hydrogens to be added to the same side? In other words, I want to get an E-alkene. Well, what can I do? Here's what I can do. If I take my alkyne and I treat it under these conditions, sodium or lithium metal, liquid ammonia, at low temperature, I can get 
my z uh, E alkene in which the hydrogens have been added to opposite sides of the alkyne. Now there are lots of other reactions we've covered this semester that involve hydrogen and a palladium or platinum catalyst. For example, one practical way of getting a straight chain alkylated benzene is to subject benzene to this sequence. I take my benzene, treat it with Friedel-Crafts acylation to put an acyl group on the benzene, and then I can hydrogenate, reducing that carbonyl all the way to an alkane. That gives me a straight chain alkylated benzene. Also, I can take a nitro compound, treat it with hydrogen gas, palladium carbon, and reduce it to an amine. Similarly, that will work for nitrobenzene, as shown here. Now, I should mention that this reaction also works if you add uh, acid to active metal catalysts instead of just using palladium and carbon catalysts. Now, once again, I only mention this detail right here because it's sometimes found on standardized exams and not because it's actually important for any of you in your personal lives. Now here are some other hydrogenation examples. In the first, I can take an imine, that is a carbon-nitrogen double bond, treat it with hydrogen, palladium, and reduce it to an amine. Similarly, I can take a nitrile, carbon-nitrogen triple bond, hydrogen gas, and rainy nickel, reducing it to an amine. I can take an aldehyde, treat it with H2 and rainy nickel, reduce it to a primary alcohol, and I can also take a ketone, reduce it under the same conditions to a secondary alcohol. Now I'm going to remind you of a reaction that might seem like an unrelated tangent, but I promise you it really does have something to do with catalytic hydrogenation, which you'll see shortly. I promise. It won't take long. I'm sure you're waiting with the same level of anticipation that you'd experience while waiting for another Saw movie to arrive in theaters. As we discussed in the past, when a primary amine is added to a ketone, it forms an imine, shown here. In slight contrast, when the secondary amine is reacted with a ketone, it forms an enamine. How can you keep this straight? Well, remember that primary amines have two hydrogens on the nitrogen. Hence, the nitrogen will replace those bonds by forming a double bond to this carbon, as shown in this imine. A secondary amine only has one hydrogen bonded to the nitrogen, so the nitrogen will replace that one bond with a single bond to the carbon. Now, in order to keep the carbon in the same oxidation state as it was in the ketone starting material, the double bond has to be installed at this position. Now, as I've said before, I love the word enamine because it sounds kind of like the Spanish word Enemigo, which means enemy. Are you an amigo or an enemigo? Are you an amin or an enemine? And here we are, at the place where I relate the previous slide to catalytic hydrogenation. See, I told you it wouldn't take long. <laughs> so here's the deal. If you treat an imine, like this one shown here, this particular imine is uh, unstable, with hydrogen and palladium cat catalyst, it will reduce it to an amine. This whole process is called reductive amination. Reductive bickalika duka luka dookie amination. <laughs> Two reactions that consistently reappear in standardized exams are Clemenson and Wolf Kishner reduction reactions. Now I've been an organic chemist for over eight years now and I've never once actually run one of these reactions. Nevertheless, standardized examiners keep putting them on their exams. So here's the overall reaction. If I want to replace a carbonyl, that is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, with uh, a fully reduced carbon, a carbon that's single bonded to two hydrogens, what I can do is I can subject it to Clemenson reduction conditions, which is zinc mercury and HCl, or wolf kishner reduction conditions, which is uh, this compound and the hydroxide, fully reducing it to my desired alkane. I hope that you can look at these conditions and marvel at their glory. So here are some lecture problems. First one, what reaction sequence below would convert benzene into the following molecule? Next, molecule A reacts with two moles of hydrogen to give molecule B. Now I should mention that anytime you see this, that tells you that molecule A is an alkyne. Okay? Which catalyst could affect this conversion? Next problem, what reagents would convert 
two non ein into z non two ein. Next question, what is the final product of the following reaction sequence? And what conditions could affect the following transformation? We now return to get discussing Grignard reagents more in depth. As you already know, Grignard reagents act kind of like carbanions. That is, as if there were a negative charge on the carbon that's bonded to the magnesium. And because a negatively charged carbon is much less stable than a negatively charged oxygen. After all, carbon is less electronegative and therefore less able to handle a negative charge. Grignard reagents are extremely reactive. As a result, Grignard reagents can't be used in solvents that have structures that will react with Grignard reagents. Otherwise, a Grignard reagent will just react with the solvent and not with the starting material. We can add Grignard reagents to aldehydes, which will convert them into secondary alcohols after quench. Or we can react Grignard reagent with ketones, which after they acid quench, will yield a tertiary alcohol. Just to review, I'd like to show you the mechanism for this reaction. Once again, we have our starting material, either an aldehyde or ketone. It's treated with a Grignard agent, which reacts basically just like a negative charge on the carbon. Electrons come in, kick that boy in the crotch, kick the electrons up, generating this alkoxide intermediate, and that negative charge gets protonated in the quench to give me my final product. Now let's do some problems. I want you to use a Grignard reaction on an aldehyde or a ketone to synthesize the following compounds listed here. I should advise you, of course, that this may be a good place for you to pause the video if you wish and attempt these problems first on your own, since I will momentarily give you all of the answers, just like in real life. Here's our first answer. We want to form pentan-2-ol from a starting aldehyde or ketone. Now you'll notice that this is a secondary alcohol, so I'm going to have to start with an aldehyde. Here's the aldehyde that I chose. If I wanted to react that with this methyl Grignard, the negative charge would come in here, kick the electrons up, giving me this intermediate. This negatively charged oxygen would then be quenched in the workup to generate this product. Now, I haven't shown it here, but you could also start with the opposite aldehyde, that is the aldehyde that has the methyl group, and add a propyl Grignard, and you'd get the same product as well. Here's the answer to our next question. I want to make this product 1-phenyl butan 2 all. How in the world can I do this starting from an aldehyde or a ketone? Well, I'm going to pick this aldehyde. I'll react it with this Grignard reagent, which once again behaves as if there were a negative charge on this carbon. Electrons come in, kick those up, give me this intermediate. The negative charge gets quenched in the workup. Now, once again, I haven't shown it, but you could start with the aldehyde that has the benzene ring in it and react it with the ethyl Grignard and get the same product as well. Here's the answer to our last question. I want to make this compound using a Grignard reaction. It's, of course, a tertiary alcohol, which means that I have to start with a ketone. Here's my starting ketone. If I treat that with ethyl Grignard, which once again behaves as if there were a negative charge on this carbon. Electrons go in, electrons go up, give me this intermediate. This gets quenched in the workup to give me the final product. I hope that makes sense. Now this slide shows how we can use Grignard reagents with lots of different compounds to get a whole slew of different products. Foremost, I could treat uh, formaldehyde, which is the simplest aldehyde with Grignard reagent, and generate a primary alcohol after quench. Similarly, I could take a Grignard to an epoxide, quench it, to get this type of extended primary alcohol. I could take a Grignard to an aldehyde like this to get me my secondary alcohol, or I could treat it with a ketone to get a a tertiary alcohol. Grignard added to an ester, this is interesting and a point that you should understand, actually ends up adding in twice. So the electrons on the Grignard add in once, electrons go up, electrons go down, it kicks off this OR double prime, and then a second R minus comes in, ultimately arriving at a tertiary alcohol. So remember, you cannot hit an ester only once with a Grignard reagent. You have to hit it twice. Similar thing can be said with an acid chloride as seen here. So here are some problems. True or false, Grignard addition is irreversible. Next question, identify the missing starting material. Next question, identify the major products of the following reactions and draw the mechanisms of their formation. And last problem, which of the following is not a suitable solvent for preparing a Grignard reagent? 
We'll now turn to the addition of hydride, or H minus, to aldehydes and ketones. As you should quickly see, the hydride reactions I'm going to show you over the next several slides are all reducing reactions because they decrease the starting material's total number of bonds to oxygen by adding hydrogen atoms to them. You'll also notice that they're very, very analogous to Grignard additions. The only difference is I'm adding an H minus instead of an R minus. So what is the overall mechanism? I start with an aldehyde or a ketone and treat it with H minus from sodium borohydride comes in, kicks that boy in the crotch, electrons go up to give me this intermediate, which is then protonated in the workup to give me my final product, which would be a primary alcohol if I were starting with an aldehyde, or a secondary alcohol if I were starting from a ketone. <clears throat> Let's turn to some problems. I want you to show me how to prepare the following products by reacting an aldehyde or a ketone with sodium borohydride. I should advise you once again that this may be a good place to pause, because I'm going to show you soon all of the dancers. Uh, sorry, I mean all of the answers. So here's the answer to my first question. I want to form this secondary alcohol. Now because it's a secondary alcohol, that indicates to me that if I wanted to form it by using a sodium borohydride reduction of something, that something would have to be a ketone and not an aldehyde. Here's the ketone that I would start with. I treat that with sodium borohydride and water in the quench. It should make this product. How? The H minus from the sodium borohydride comes right in here. Electrons get kicked up to give me this intermediate. That gets protonated in the quench. Hence, we get to the product. Here's the next answer. I want to make this, which is a primary alcohol from an aldehyde or ketone. It's, of course, going to start from an aldehyde. I start with this aldehyde, treat it with the, these conditions. I should get this product. How? H minus comes in from sodium borohydride. Electrons go up to give me this intermediate. It gets quenched in the workup to give me the product. And here's our final answer. We want to make this, which is a tertiary alcohol, using a sodium borohydride reduction. Now I have to tell you, I was kind of playing with you guys right here. You cannot make a tertiary alcohol using a sodium borohydride reduction. Ha ha! <laughs> I tricked you. So how would I make it? Well, you should observe that because this is a tertiary alcohol, from our previous lecture slides, you can see that we can make this using a Grignard reagent. Thus, if I start with a ketone, like acetone, for example, and I treat it with this Grignard reagent, the negative charge on this cyclohexane comes in, kicks those electrons up, gives me this, which is then protonated in the workup. Yeehaw. But you can once again see how similar or analogous Grignard addition is to sodium borohydride reduction. So what occurs when I add a hydride reagent to a carboxylic acid? Well, as it turns out, carboxylic acids are not as easy to reduce as aldehydes and ketones. Thus, if you treat a carboxylic acid with sodium borohydride, nothing happens. In other words, sodium borohydride is not a strong enough source of H- to reduce a carboxylic acid. So what do we do? We use this reagent called lithium aluminum hydride, which is an extremely reactive source of H-. So once again, sodium borohydride won't touch a carboxylic acid. If we want to reduce a carboxylic acid, we have to pull out the big guns and use lithium aluminum hydride. Now, because it's such a powerful source of H minus, lithium aluminum hydride reduces carboxylic acids all the way down to primary alcohols by adding two successive hydrides into the carbonyl carbon. And just so you know, acid chlorides are also reduced all the way down to primary alcohols by lithium aluminum hydride. So let me ask, do you think that sodium borohydride will reduce an ester? Yeah, esters are also not super reactive. So the answer is generally no. Instead, if we want to reduce an ester, we once again turn to lithium aluminum hydride, our most potent source of H minus. As with carboxylic acids, lithium aluminum hydride reduces esters all the way down to primary alcohols. Now once again, I just want you guys to remember, if I want to reduce a carboxylic acid or an ester, I can't use piddly little sodium borohydride. I've got to use something better lithium aluminum hydride. And just so you know, esters and acid chlorides once again undergo two successive reactions with hydride uh, ion and with Grignard reagents. So if I add a Grignard reagent to an ester or an acid chloride, it will add twice, just like hydride with lithium aluminum hydride. So what if I have an ester and I only want to reduce it to an aldehyde instead of going all the way? to a primary alcohol, what can I do?
Do I have to enlist the help of magical leprechauns? No, I don't. What I do is I use this reagent, which is called diisobutyl aluminum hydride, commonly referred to as Diball or Diball H. Di ball. Di ball. When I stir an ester at negative 78 degrees Celsius with Diball, I can selectively reduce it down to an aldehyde and stop there rather than going all the way to an alcohol. Isn't that neat? I mean, we're probably not going to declare a national holiday over it or anything, but I still think it's pretty freaking cool. Let's go back to lithium aluminum hydride for a moment, but this time we'll focus on amides. You see, when we react to amides with lithium aluminum hydride, a slightly different product is formed, an amine. Once again, I want you to remember, lithium aluminum hydride reduces carboxyl acids and esters all the way down to primary alcohols. In contrast, lithium aluminum hydride reduces amides down to amines. And by the way, sodium borohydride, once again, is not powerful enough to reduce amides to amines. So we can see several examples. I've got a primary amide hit with lithium aluminum hydride. It goes to a primary amine. Secondary or alkylated amide goes to a secondary amine. A tertiary amide goes to a tertiary amine. So now we arrive at some questions. Which of the sequences below would most efficiently affect the indicated transformation? What is the product of the following reaction? Now I should point out here that this, instead of being quenched with a source of H+, is quenched with a source of D+, that's deuterium. It reacts basically exactly like an H, except it's a D. So what in the world would happen here? Which of the following will reduce benzoic acid to benzyl alcohol? And what product is formed with benzamide is reduced with lithium aluminum hydride? The product of the following reaction is optically active, a racemic mixture, or an enantio-enriched compound, or a meso compound. And which reagents could affect the following transformation? We now turn to a different topic, using protecting groups in total synthesis. Now, as you should remember, lithium aluminum hydride will reduce an ester to an alcohol, and it will also reduce ketones. So if I wanted to somehow magically convert this starting material into this product and leave the ketone untouched, what in the world could I do? What I have to do is protect my ketone. Here's the way we do that. The ketone group can be protected as a ketal in this synthesis. So the way I handle that is I take my starting material and treat it with this compound, which is ethane diol. Catalytic acid then converts it into this uh, intermediate right here. The ketone has now been protected. It's no longer a ketone. It's this type of compound called a ketal. Hit that with lithium aluminum hydride. It will reduce the ester all the way down, adding in two successive hydrides to this primary alkoxide, which then gets protonated to the primary alcohol. The acid then also hydrolyzes and removes this protecting group to give me back the ketone. And now we enter the world of awesome metallic coupling reactions, which is one of my favorite topics. Foremost, I want to tell you guys that the following reactions are total crap. That is a nucleophile coming in to this position and kicking off a bromide. It'll never happen. This position kicking off a bromide? Never happen. Why? Because you can't do an SN2 reaction on sp2 hybridized carbon. You just can't. sp2 hybridized carbon has too much electron density around it you can't have a nucleophile come in and kick off a bromide. So what in the world can we do? Well, here's what we do. We enter the world of coupling reactions. I can take a compound of this type. This could be an sp2 hybridized carbon. It isn't in this example. But I treat it with this type of reagent called an organocuprate. An organocuprate will effectively put the alkyl chain that's stuck to the copper and re uh, replace the halogen with it, giving me this coupled product right here. The thing I want to stress right here is the fact that this is not really an SN2 reaction. It operates by a different mechanism, but can effectively work on sp2 hybridized carbons as well as sp3 hybridized carbons and sp hybridized carbons. So let's take a look at how we, that would actually apply. So right here I've got an sp2 hybridized carbon and another sp2 hybridized carbon, both stuck to halogens. I hit them with an organocuprite and hip hop array, I indeed get complete replacement of the halogen atoms 
with the alkyl groups that are stuck to the carbon. Once again, this is not an SN2 mechanism. I don't require you to know the mechanism, but I want you to understand that it is not an SN2. And we can also do coupling reactions using these types of compounds called alkyl boranes. All right. So what I do is I've got all of these different alkyl halides in which the halogen is stuck to an sp2 hybridized carbon. I can replace that halogen with an alkyl group stuck to my borane by treating it with catalytic palladium and hydroxide. This type of reaction is called a Suzuki reaction. Here are some problems. Predict the products of the following organocuprate reactions. And predict the products of the following Suzuki reactions. We'll now address one of my favorite reactions of all time, alkene metathesis. An alkene, which is also called an olefin, can undergo this reaction called metathesis. And it's a super cool reaction invented by three guys named Grubbs, Schrock, and Chauvin, who won uh, together the 2005 Nobel Prize for it. It basically takes two alkenes and stitches them together like this. I take this type of compound. You see an alkene here and another alkene here. I hit them with this catalyst called Grubbs catalyst. That's a ruthenium catalyst. And there are other catalysts that can do this operation as well. These two carbons get bonded together and form a double bond. And these two carbons get uh, released as ethylene gas. Now, according to Alan Grubbs, uh, one of the guys who uh, won the Nobel Prize there for this, this reaction has been used to form polymers that are employed in materials for bathroom sinks, parts of uh, farming combines, stronger baseball hats, and even tank armor. Now here's the mechanism, which you don't have to know, but I think is super cool. M, by the way, represents a metal, which is usually ruthenium, tungsten, or molybdenum. And here are some problems. What products would be obtained from the metathesis of the following alkenes? Give the product of the ring-closing metathesis for each of the following compounds, and what alkene will undergo metathesis to form the following products? I'll now introduce you to our last reaction of the day, called the Wittig reaction. Now please remember that this name, Wittig, is German. Hence the W makes a V sound, not a W sound. In other words, I don't want any of you guys calling this a Wittig reaction, or I will cry. This reaction is supremely awesome because it converts a ketone into an alkene. So here's how that works. I have a ketone right here, and I want to have my carbon be double bonded to a carbon, not double bonded to an oxygen. So I treat it with this reagent, which is called a Wittig reagent, or a phosphonium illid. What occurs is a partner swap, just like one of those crazy reality TV shows. The oxygen ends up being double bonded to the phosphorus uh, as a byproduct, and the carbon that's bonded to the phosphorus in this Wittig reagent gets double bonded to the carbon in the starting material. So I end up with an alkene and this uh, phosphine oxide walking away as a byproduct. Now this reaction is super cool. One thing that I sort of have to mention parenthetically is I love this word illid. It starts with the letter Y. I always want to pronounce that Y-lide. But don't you dare pronounce it Y-lide because that's not how it's pronounced. <laughs> Here's another example of this. I could take this starting ketone, treat it with this Wittig reagent, and I end up with this product right here. Now here's the mechanism which I'm only showing for your reference and curiosity, not because I require you to know it. And here are some questions. Question number one, ring opening metathesis polymerizations have the following general equation. <gasps> what starting cycloalkene would you need to form this polymer? Next question, identify the product and draw the reaction mechanism for the following transformation. Next question, identify the missing coupling partner in the following Suzuki reaction. And last question, identify the missing reagent. Now that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope that it's been enjoyable and illuminating for you. Stay tuned for our next lecture in which we'll learn about addition reactions to alkenes.